I think it's great to have you on board today. If you're building a new home, this is certainly something we shouldn't be overlooking. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on this show. Um, I, I feel like I'm in the education sector right now in my career. And that's exactly what you guys are doing right now is educating your clients and the contractors out there. And, and I would like to think that the kind of work that I do uh, goes hand in hand with the quality and craftsmanship that, that you guys are putting into your projects as well. I mean, it certainly amplifies it, right? So we've got all this thought, the details, the foresight, and then when you take it and you extend it into the outdoor living space, it just simply boosts the communication that this is a one of a kind home. Right, from the second You're you You're approaching pull up. something very special. From the second you pull up, sorry to interrupt you, from the no, second you yeah. pull up, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, so getting the feel for the inside of the home by starting on the outside of the home with mm -hmm. the large natural stone, with the details and the, and the cuts and the craftsmanship that go into the hardscaping. And then you're gonna walk in the home and you're gonna see even more incredible detail and craftsmanship. So they go hand in hand with gold, not only you know all luxury homes, but specifically Golden Eagle homes. I, I love incorporating the, the type and my style with your guys' style for sure. Most people don't think about it and then they get to the end of their project and now they start thinking about landscaping and now you know maybe yeah. the budget isn't there to do some yeah. cool stuff like you do. So it's important to have you guys involved right from the beginning, I think, yeah. It was even planned out with the Forever Home, you know, all those pavers out on that Solana area and then the front covered porch as well. Hmm. You know, there, there are no deck walking surfaces. It's the hardscaping, right? the pavers. There's, no, there's something to be said about having it planned out. It could even affect the architectural drawings or the architectural ideas of the, of the home when you think, start thinking about how the hardscape could be involved. Yeah. I love that. It's a prime example of, you know, where the industry is going when when a client start think, starts thinking about, you know, pavers as a sustainable surface for their porch floor on their log home. Like to me, like that right. was just a definition of where we're at right now and how people are starting to look at hardscape products, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. I think we're gonna have an easy, uh, easy time talking about this stuff. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've been doing some trade shows lately? Seminars, conferences, trade shows, whenever I can Get, yeah. get the word out there in the road yeah about the herd you know it's yeah it's meeting and greeting people only so much can be done virtually right right it was awesome to see the results you guys had at that that huge show that you went to in, uh, hardscape north america that one yeah yeah that was really cool that was like our introduction to the industry right yeah yeah and all those podcasts you guys did the interviews yep that was neat to see yeah was that one in kentucky the other one in kentucky yeah it's in right. louisville every year yeah and, okay yeah. People come, yeah. And then were you in the Northeast too, I saw? I went to the, there's another trade, the second largest one in the country is in, is in Hartford, Connecticut, and that's the Northeast Hardscape Expo. So okay. we, didn't, we didn't, you know, have our display going on there quite as much, but the same thing, just getting out there, talking to the people in the industry. I mean, right now I'm just trying to build the biggest network that I can, yeah. <laughs> you know, just like being here. Right. right. It's all about expanding your network because you never know what's going to come in over time, right? Mm -hmm. you know? What do you think really pushed you over the edge, like as far as you know, really expanding out of just Wisconsin, central Wisconsin, maybe what was well, that was almost by default, like, like was when it? I headed down to Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, that really that that I kind of stumbled across that I guess it's about it was about get you know, starting a YouTube channel led to that getting my face on camera. That was never like an aspiration of mine or, or anything like that. I always just joke with people wherever the next lead comes in, you know, whether that's northern Wisconsin or right here in my hometown or that one happened to be Knoxville, Tennessee. Right. So yeah. yeah, he found you on Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram direct yeah. message. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. And okay. that's the one you did the helipad on, right? Yeah, that was yeah. the Tennessee mic drop and phase three. We phased that one out into the helipad, and and you know, you, you brought we started off with this story right away. But when I get out to these conferences or these speaking events, I'm telling this same story. I mean, how did a guy from Wisconsin Rapids? I always accredit people and tell them our population when I come, when I come <laughs> yeah. from here and, you know, we're getting called out to Knoxville and then, and then, you know, and then led to Nashville with a, a family member of that client in Knoxville hired me go to, to go down to Nashville. And it works out for my schedule because in Wisconsin, you know, we get shut down for four or five months because uh -huh. of, right. of the climate. So yeah, yeah that, that all just happened by default or by getting myself out there on social media. Wow. That's, That's cool. cool. Yeah. And that was before Hardscape Mentor even started, right? That was before Hardscape Mentor. Yeah. And it's, the, what the tie together there is that getting out there, you know, leaving my nest in Wisconsin Rapids kind of opened my eyes up to who was following me. Uh -huh. and, it, and it was it was that client who I had no idea was following me. But then it was, it was also a bunch of young, hungry hardscapers who are want to start their business and, and want to do the things that I'm doing. 
and I met those guys on that on those trips to Tennessee. I continued to meet these young guys. So it's just crazy how that's that's the story in a nutshell is like that guy seen my work, got me to Tennessee. I met some kids who said that, you know, I should give back to the industry because they could learn a lot from me. The next thing you know, I, you know, I came back and talked to my videographer at the time, Luke Parmeter, who is now my business partner. We don't make uh, promotional videos so much anymore. We're making training content videos now, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, man, it's just it's just crazy how how things work out. <laughs> and that's got to be such a premier project. Like, not many hardscapers have ever done something as big as that Tennessee project. Yeah, no, that was. I always tell people that there's now going into risks. Like, if something approaches me and it's a risk or or it might be a challenge, I'm more apt to take it on when you come through a challenge or a risk like that. I mean, for me to go down to Tennessee with no crew, living in a hotel room for 15 weeks and, and put together the biggest project of my life, like, I'm not gonna lie, I was at my wit's end a lot of days, but to drive down that mountain when I was done, like, yelling out the window of my truck, like, I just <laughs> conquered the world. Yeah. <laughs> How do you even get started with the vision of a project that big? Like, where does the conversation start with the client? Did the client have a collection of ideas? And, uh, you know, did they have goals for you as to what you wanted to, I would say yeah. to do? I would say yes. You know, mm-hmm. you know, lots of times it just starts out with how are you going to use this space or what would you like to see here? The Tennessee project uh, ended up being so large because we had a 20-foot drop in elevation and they wanted to put in a pool scape or a pool deck. Well, just there has to be some massive retention then because they didn't have a flat yard to put mm-hmm. in a pool scape. So that's... That's kind of how that all worked out. And then they had a, a, a walkway in place that wasn't sufficient. So they're like, we, we need a new walkway that this one is, is breaking up. It's old concrete. So it, it starts with their, their, well, for sure, it starts with solving their problem, which is almost their need, right? And then it, then it can go to their wants a little bit. But yeah, the client has to, has to call me out there with a problem most of the time, right? And then I just try and solve that as creatively as I can. Uh-huh. So, so do you design your projects um, beforehand on a, on a software rendering like my background is design yeah. as well so i'm always curious how, how that works for for landscapers like yourself when i first started designing uh for design and build firm we'd have to start everything in cad which i'm sure people in this building are familiar with cad yeah but then we take it uh, then we would have to then we'd import our cad into our sketchup well into sketchup is the software that i use now i now i just start right in sketchup i'm i'm pretty proficient when i'm when i'm drawing in there it's almost like i'm drawing with a paper and pencil which was before CAD, when I first started designing, very first time they let me in the office, I was drawing things with pencil, handing it off to another designer to put it in CAD, then he would put it in SketchUp, but then I just, I had to streamline that process when I went on my own. So it was just write the SketchUp because I can bring up the three-dimensional aspects quick, quickly. I, I think that's super important, yeah. So, so you're basically starting with conceptuals first, given, given the visual, given the idea, drawing the dream essentially, and then you're going back and, and figuring out the technical aspects of yeah. it essentially. I think I start with like a line concept. Like when the, when the client from Tennessee approached me, he's like, hey, we wanna put up some retaining walls here. We wanna, you know, we wanna build this terrace here. We want a new walkway here. To me, it's all about, you know, I use, I've been using this line a lot, of, but it's about access and flow. You know, like, the, you know, Zach's house is a pers- perfect example of that, how we can make our way all the way around the house mm-hmm. on some sort of path or it was thought about. I mean, excavation world, they call it wayfinding when they're putting together a large commercial project. Right. So I think it kind of starts with that. I start drawing some lines on, on how they're going to get around their property. Then it just you like these lines. Yep, we like the lines. And then it just keeps going from there. <laughs> <laughs> so when would when, uh, when do you get involved in, in a residential project when? When's probably a good time to reach out to a landscape architect or hardscaper like yourself when, when we're in the design process? When you, the day you get the blueprints and you have your lot, I mean, that's my opinion. I'm, I'm working with a client right now down in Madison and you know they've had to move the foundation on their lot a couple times, but that's fine. I'm not designing anything like exactly yet until they dig that hole, mm-hmm. we'll say. But right, right now, the, the, the second you sit, start thinking about it, for one thing, schedule, you know, a lot of good hardscapers and landscape companies are booked out, you know, nine, 12 months at a time. So schedule is one thing, but just like the planning, like if you're going into a, a, a big um, project, no matter what it is, I feel it's better to have everything planned out to, to be successful, right? Whether that's all the way down to your mailbox at the end of the road, let's start figuring out when we're doing the foundation. So I agree. I mean, one thing is budget too. I think, you know, many people on the residential side don't think about their landscaping or hardscaping from the beginning. 
and they reached the end of the project and didn't, didn't put that into their budget. And now it's kind of one of those things that that guy gets left off and you're kind of trying to squeeze that in there. If you can plan for it right from the beginning, you can have an, an awesome yeah. hardscape. Project. I was trying to leave out the money side of it, but that's, right. that definitely, yeah. but that's, definitely, that's <laughs> definitely part of it. And I deal with that a lot. Yeah. Well, it extends the living space, right? We're just bringing it from indoors to outdoors. So whether it's outdoor kitchens, outdoor showers, incredible fire pit areas, but these are gathering spaces. The When you have visitors over, you don't need to just be inside the home. Yeah, exactly, so why wouldn't you think about it from day one? Just like when you start planning your living room right. or your den, right? like where's the outside living room and den, Yeah. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And your spaces are so attractive, right? Everyone wants to be out there. They wanna look <laughs> at that hardscaping and, and look at the artwork and the creativity. I love the incorporation of starting with the plans because you did that in the forever home. You know, we've got walking surfaces that are all of your pavers and it seamlessly flows. There are no steps going from inside the house to the, the outdoor walking surfaces. And you've got all this beautiful material and it then blends into the hardscaping beyond the house too. So we're not only underneath that Solana area, but then it expands so much further. Yeah, right. I, I love the, the Solana project for sure because I got to, that's like the exact definition of bringing the inside out. It is. Are you serious? Coming out from underneath the Solana roof out into the fire pit and I'm still going to, you know, direct access and flow with that inlay to get you out to the fire pit from the hot tub area. But yeah, that's sustainable floor in the Solana is that's next level. And I hope that opens up future buyers <laughs> in your industry to to what can be done with pavers, you know, as, as an in, indoor surface, what I mm -hmm. thought was pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen you do permeable pavers, or maybe it's just um, like the, the grouting yeah. that's in between the pavers. Can we speak to that a little bit, and why would you use that? Sometimes on these municipalities or, or these shorelines or lake lakefronts I'm working on, there's only so much um, impervious surface you can have. It comes into play there. A lot of it is just water management. When I go into uh, someone's backyard or when I go into design, I just did a, a, cla a little uh, class on this. It's like the first two things I'm looking for are how I'm getting my equipment back there, and the second one is where's the water gonna go, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, whether it's a new construction or an existing home, like where's the water gonna go when I start to put surfaces in out here? Sometimes you might have no choice but to make it permeable. And when we say permeable, we're just, we're just making a wider joint. The pavers come with a bigger bevel or a lug on the side to, to provide that you know half inch, three eighths inch gap. We're filling that with a with a chip material that can that can you know drain the water, and we're just sending that down into an open graded reservoir, so so none of the water has to be uh, shed off the top. It is now down through. So it's it's another thing that's you know helping the industry evolve, right? It, it's a it's a progressive uh, type of paving system, but we're coming up with lots and lots of uses for it now. Mm -hmm. And speaking of water, I know you do. Um, beyond pavers and flat surfaces, you, you do some pretty amazing retaining walls, um, egress wells uh, with some of those big boulders. Those are pretty impressive too. Yeah, big rocks are my favorite favorite thing to work with. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie about that. I kind of wear that on my sleeve. I mean, working with any kind of natural stone, whether it's you know flagstone or, or flat work, or it's you know bringing in boulders the size of this table here to, to set in someone's yard. I mean, I just love doing that. Yeah. I'm moving nature around, right? For mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Where do you source a lot of your materials from? Do you have vendors you like working with? You know, I'm just thinking of like the big boulders, like where, where does that even come from? Yeah, right from the quarry as much as I can. Okay. Right? So I'm a little bit differently. I even get that question a lot from guys who are following me or, or reaching out for advice is, wow, where do you find those rocks? And it's like, probably the same place you do. I just go out there and I hand pick them. Is that right? You know, because if you just order a, a load, you're just going to get a load and, and the, the guy loading uh, your the truck has no idea what these boulders are being used for, right? He's the, on the opposite end of the of where the project is at. So it's just getting that clarification across, like you know, like those window wells on the Forever Home. I mean, I had to source the right, the exact boulder to build that. I mean, a regular reten retention wall, block retention wall is everything is segmental. It's the same size. It's flat on top and bottom. You can stagger the seams. So when I go to, into a boulder application, I want my boulders to be as boxy as possible. But then, you know, the different one in the forever home is everything on that project had to be of scale. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the square footage on that home, but right, yeah. <laughs> the boulders have to be a percentage of the square footage of the home. Right. Sure. So, okay. yeah. Even big boulders could look small against that house. That's what I mean. <laughs> That's right. what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the exact and another side, the other side of that is you don't want to put too big of a boulder in like 
in a small planting space or as an accent or something like that, or to build a, you know, seven, eight foot tall retention system, it would take, you know, it wouldn't uh -huh. be as strong over time, I don't feel, using smaller rocks. So a lot of it's peace of mind, setting 1,500, 2,000 pound rock, you know, and putting another one on top of it and backfilling it with clean stone, like it's never going to move. It's the most sustainable, you know, egress system that there is. And I joke around about those ones at the forever home, like, they got to be some of the biggest window wells in the state. They're incredible. <laughs> they are. Yeah, isn't it like five tiers of boulders? Yeah. It's and we crazy. set them all yeah. back so you could crawl. You know, you could yeah. crawl out of there. Worst right. case scenario, you mm -hmm. can get out of there if, if there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, that was a pretty cool opportunity. Definitely, <laughs> it certainly is. Now, here you're sourcing multiple materials from different locations. How do you coordinate all the colors? You know, what comes first? Do you pick out the boulders first and then order other material to, to complement yeah. it? I mean, like on the like on the Forever Home or even your project, a lot of times if I'm bringing in a natural stone, I'm playing off the veneer, right? There's already a natural stone involved in the build. So I'm always trying to play off of, even the colors of the pavers, I'm looking at the house first. So even so, if you did get a hold of me before you built your home, there's still gonna be some renderings of what your stone is gonna look like, what your siding or, or roof is gonna be. A lot of guys play off the roof for, a, a border or a banding color, like a black. Like when I put a black or a brown, I might be playing off of the shingles or I bring in the rust color boulders. Well, the forever home, if I mean, the forever home is, is a little bit different example because you even pointed this out. We use the same product that's mm -hmm. on, this, on the side of the house as the boulder because we're, we're, we're fortunate enough to work, you know, with Kafka who has, Kafka Granite who has that supply mm -hmm. from one end to the other. So yeah, I'm playing off the home's architecture exterior whole time yeah mm -hmm. you, oh, sorry to interrupt no go ahead Zach. you've got this grand vision of what it's going to look like is it ever an obstacle for your clients to commit to you moving forward because they can't quite picture the end product they're just looking at your illustrations that you put together through sketchup yeah i think along with the illustrations one thing i guess that's that saves me or helps me a little bit is the portfolio Mm -hmm. You know, they, they see that this guy has had visions in the past and they, they look like they were a success. So it, I think you can draw stuff, stuff in, in 3D and present that 3D model, but you almost need like real life builds that had a 3D model for them that look the, exactly the same mm -hmm. for them to trust and know where you're going. But it's like using so programs like, or software like SketchUp and then getting the 3D elements in there. But then, you know, the portfolio, I guess, is the trust factor, I would like to think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing I really love about what you do is <clears throat> is your portfolio and all the shapes and the different lines you take. You know, a lot of guys might just simple square, straight lines. I mean, you're doing some pretty complex layouts, which really separates like, you from a lot of the other guys out there, I think, in the industry. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's a, it goes along with working on these homes, like the natural log siding. Like, you know, there's, we're trending a lot into modern hardscaping now, and I think that's, you know, where some of the industry is going, but nothing in nature is straight, mm -hmm. you know, and we're working mm -hmm. with squares and rectangles as pavers. It's like, so I was taught at a young age, even when I was a builder, my, the designer was like, we're putting curves on everything because we're softening up the hard materials that we're working with, the hard edges, you know, the hard feel, whatever. We're, that's kind of like the school I came from was just curves and circles on everything because it's hard, straight, rigid material, right? Mm -hmm. And then I just think about that like nature, you know, is, is not perfect straight lines. I like to feel like my curves and circles are perfect, but at the same time, they're playing off of that natural aspect, right? Mm -hmm. I love seeing those overhead shots of your projects when they're, when they're all done, how you get those curves together and just, you know, you, you see it in person, it looks awesome, but then seeing that aerial view just gives you, you know, the sense that you've put a lot of thought and effort and time into that. It just, it looks magnificent from the overhead. It just looks like that home is literally coming out of the ground, coming out of the earth. It blends, you know, from nature to a man-made structure very easily, yeah. and very nicely. Well, thank you so much. And like a lot of these homes are surrounded by the woods, right? Mm -hmm. So there might be boulders and, you know, nature out in the woods. And I like how you say it just comes right together in that home, yeah. You know, most people would probably say you're an artist first. I'd like to say you certainly are, but you may be a perfectionist first <laughs> because I know firsthand there's so much prep work that you do that no one will ever see. So you, will you speak to that, all the stuff that happens before these final papers get laid? Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. One, one thing that just came to my mind when you were talking about that, an aspect on your home that, that no one sees um, uh, was 
we, we raised up that back patio, right? So we did that underneath, the, underneath your deck where we built up two tiers of boulders and we gave you that top landing area. Well, what's holding in everything underneath that deck that no one can see? Do the boulders just continue to wrap around? It's like there's a, there's a block segmental retaining wall mm -hmm. underneath your deck um, that completes that circle to hold all that base in that you don't even see. And then I had to run, you know, layers of geo grid fabric to hold that wall, whoops, sorry, to hold that wall from blowing out underneath the deck. But things like that, because I wanted to pull off that circle landing, what holds it in underneath the deck. So yeah, the integrity still has to be there, right? As much as it's creative and it's cosmetic, it still has to be built, right? And I'd imagine that a lot of people might not realize that, but on, uh, yeah, comparing day one to 20 years later, it's not like those pavers are going to be moving. Whereas maybe a do-it-yourselfer isn't quite doing the, the correct foundation, correct base. Yeah, I think that's why, why they need to hire a professional right away is because we should be the ones knowing that the, the new practices or whatever with the open graded stone now, not putting any dense graded material, any dense graded foundation material underneath our pavers. I mean, that's within all the course of my career, things have evolved, right? And also like heavy equipment has to come into play. A DIYer is not gonna excavate it as much as I'm gonna excavate it. They're not gonna bring in the amount of foundation material because they, because they don't want a wheelbarrow that much that day or whatever. So definitely something to be said about as beautiful as these projects are on top, there's a lot of planning and construction activities that go into the underneath foundations that you never see. Yeah, yeah. just well, before this podcast, I was talking to a building inspector about soils condition, you know, the PSF of soils. Is that a concern for you when, when you're doing projects? I'm a little bit. I, I, we don't have to get into it too much with the, with the engineers a lot of times, unless it's like on a massive project or something. I'm very fortunate whenever I'm building in this particular uh, county that we're in pure sand all the time. So I have to watch myself when I'm directing others because we do have to pay attention to soil types when we're putting these foundations together. Are we working in a heavy clay soil or are we working in a sandy soil? Do we want the foundation material to amend with the subsoil or do we need to separate that somehow with a, with a geotextile or or add more uh, foundation material because we are working in the clay. Okay. So yeah, definitely all that comes in comes into play. And, and that's not even, I haven't even started drawing yet or started okay. putting together the cool stuff yet, right? So yeah. <laughs> you know, here you are just doing this incredible work and you're not just keeping it to yourself. Like you're sharing this with everyone out there that's in the hardscape world. And to me, I just, I think that goes a long way for those who are in this trade because at the end of the day, they wanna be able to stand behind their work, they wanna get those referrals, they wanna have clients that, that love their work forever. And you're teaching them how to take it to the next level, whether it's design work, but even just like the, the foundation, the principles of everything as well. Yeah, thank you. I think for a long time in the trades, I think I'm old enough to say, it wasn't always like the hip thing to do was sharing your work, right? I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys have seen that with carpenters, plumbers, electricians, all these other industry guys. Now with social media, we are starting to share how we put things together. But, you know, I would say year one, year two, probably when I even when I was working on your home, I knew I was doing creative work that was different than everybody else. And maybe I was covering that up a little bit, right? And I, and I think trades guys used to do that back in the day. You didn't want to let your secrets out there. Uh -huh. But now it's all just flipped for me, for sure. My, my line is I don't want to be the last guy building cool stuff. I mean, Golden Eagle is going to be around forever. We still need kids putting together Solana floors, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of where it all came to. Is like, I'm building cool stuff, but I'm also aging. So, <laughs> <laughs> but then meeting these guys who are, who just made me made me realize all the all the experience I took for granted was now I can give that back. And the satisfaction of going into someone's backyard changed to the satisfaction of you know a kid being able to go into multiple backyards. So yeah, I, I like that you pointed that out. I think anybody could do it in any trade. If you've been building log homes for 23 years, you could start a hardscape or you could start a log home mentor, right? But it's it's kind of where things have gone gone with me. But I, I don't think that I was always so willingly willingness to share. Was, I don't think that was always there. What I like about it is, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a shortage of, of guys getting into our industry, you know, into the trades. And you're attracting young people into not only your trade, but to the whole trade that you're, you're making it look cool, making it look fun, you know, yeah. taking that artistic side to it and putting it into, you know, the trades into the home building industry. I think that is huge. We're going to need new, young, energetic workers in the future. And 
and you're leading that right now, man. Oh, man. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you guys even do with your video content. I mean, you, even putting together a podcast like this is making working for a gold home, uh, a log home manufacturer cool and hip. You know, when uh -huh. you guys look, I mean, you guys probably weren't weren't thinking you're going to do this when you started working here. Now <laughs> look at you, right? Social right. media podcasts. It's making all the trades cool. Mm -hmm. I like that you like that you said that for sure. But I think it. I think you guys are doing the same thing for. For people who want to get into your industry yeah i doubt there are many young people out there that are inspired to build a, a vinyl sided home yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're an exactly ordinary right. track home you're right. exactly right yeah yeah no, they, they want to be creative they want special work that they can be proud of a, a an incredible portfolio that they can share with others mm -hmm. and even if you're not sharing it with others you can know at the end of the day hey i'm I'm doing something that is incredible mm -hmm. so let's explain to people that are listening that don't know the, the hardscape mentor program you started so that's People can join your herd, the, the herd, yeah. we'll call it, right? Yep. And um, I guess tell us a little bit what exactly yeah. are so, you doing with it. So Luke, Luke and I started out, we, we wanted to have the largest uh, virtual training academy on the planet, right? It was going to be, you know, on-demand, um, website-based, where where guys could log on, they could search a topic, and, and, it's, and it's coming from me when I'm building it in the field. So I think that's a little bit different as well. A lot of the training platforms out there now are put together by maybe people who work for the manufacturer or the vendor who aren't out in the field every day doing the work. So I'm literally going to be out on my saw, you know, next week and, and Luke Parmer is going to be there capturing my footage and I'm going to slow it down and say, this is how you walk the line. This is how you hold your saw. And so just taking the, my real life applications right now, putting that into training content is really what Hardscape Mentor started out as. I would say it started out as that because now we do have the herd and that's basically the community of these young guys who who want to who want to do the work like we're doing and who want to learn who want to streamline their work that's another thing with these young people is they don't want to work for somebody for 17 years like I did they're 22 years old they want to start their business tomorrow well with a community like the herd you and the website we have you can almost do that because what the community is is a, is a private Facebook group and then a private Zoom call that we, when we get together with all these people. So the community and the website, that's what Hardscape Mentor is. We like to say with a guide by your side, you know, you can take on, you can take on any next lead that comes in. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So you've got the monthly Zoom call with, yeah. with everyone that's invited. Yeah. At least, in, do you have different levels of membership as well? Yep, we do. So we have, we have a standard membership because we didn't want to, to me it's all about, re, and Luke as well, it's all about reaching as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, how many kids can I, can we inspire to become hardscapers? I mean, it's crazy that I'm even in the position to say that <laughs> or have that, have that control, but I feel like we are. So we wanted to get the, we wanted to get the website out there and the tutorials out there. So that's the standard membership. People can invest $47 a month and they can get their hand, they can un, un, right away automatically unlock, you know, almost 200 tutorials on the website, right? But then if you want to be part of the community, then you're a little bit more invested. You know, then you get to hang out with us once a month in a Zoom call. And the private Facebook group is one of the most positive, supportive, you know, Facebook communities in our industry, for sure, because everyone is, you know, is paying to be there so that they're, they know where everyone is at and we're all there, you know, to, to help each other level up. Mm -hmm. So really the community aspect, we had no idea. Like when you ask what Hardscape Mentor is, it's virtual training and this massive community right now that we're building. So I, I like that you, that awesome. you brought that up. That's cool. With your app that you guys have, can videos be downloaded to the device? So even if a guy is in an area without good cell phone reception, he can still then go watch your tutorial. Is would, that available? Yeah, right. He could download oh, cool. the video to his to his device. I, I like that you brought that up because the app is, we feel, has been a game changer. Uh -huh. You know, just like when you said to, when we set up at the Hardscape uh, at these Hardscape expos, you know, we're, we're the only education rep sector represented. At, in, a, in a show with hundreds of booths there. So it's just wild that this has never been a thing for the industry and now you know we're getting into this and, and we're, we're taking kids and making them hardscapers, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I love that you're embracing the idea of community. It is certainly something that's so important. And I think like ultimately with you, Dan, as well as with Luke, like you guys come from a place of gratitude. Like your hearts are full. You're, you just wanna teach others. You wanna bring people on board. That's so much of what we do here at Golden Eagle. I was going to say, you're talking like, about yourself. We love, too. <laughs> we love sharing more information, right? We want people to build the home that's perfect for them. And when we work with clients, we are grateful to be working with them. We feel flattered that they chose us. We want to help them have the perfect home. Yeah. yeah. I think that's one of the reasons I was excited about being on the show was because I was thinking about your, your platform and, and, and why you're doing this show. And it's to educate. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's yep. to educate. That that's the sector that I'm in right now. Why not yeah. go hang out with some other guys <laughs> yeah. who, are, who are educated? <laughs> Definitely. Right. And that's exactly what you're doing. Whether you're educating your clients is I think is maybe your original approach, right? Yep, it is. But I, I know you guys are educating contractors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Just by default. Right. There's builders watching this trying to figure out how to build their next project. I guarantee that, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's next for the hardscaping world? How do you see it developing in the future? <clears throat> What's next is I feel it's, it's more popular right now than it ever has. Like where it's going to go, I think the sky is the limit. Like talking about the Solana floor or some of these some of these uh, people looking at hardscaping differently now. Um, I was just at one of these conferences and there's a an 80 year old guy there who's owned a paver manufacturer company for a hundred years out east, and and he said we're in the infancy of hardscaping right now. Hmm. And that was probably one of the coolest lines I've ever heard. What does he mean by that? He means that. In Europe or England, they, the square footage per capita is 30 square feet per capita that they're paving. And in America, it's two square feet because we were so caught up on concrete ready mix, mm -hmm. right? Because everything had to be fast and we were growing super fast. And it's along with the foresight. Did you think about what this concrete or this asphalt is going to look like 20 years down the road? Well, Europe must have did that research. And so his comment was, we're just getting started. People are just starting to realize what hardscaping can do for them, which I've almost seen in my 25 year career, looking back at year one, who I was working for and what I was building, and now the type of stuff that's going on. And I, I feel like maybe the COVID years played a little bit a part of that. And people changed how they were living at home. Mm -hmm. But I think that just brought it into retrospect, like what you could do for your backyard. So I, I'm going to use that guy's line. He's been in it for 80 years. We're just getting started. <laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> like concrete aprons right outside of garages. Do you see those being paved in the future more, more regularly? Yeah. Or at least the apron, right? Yeah. I like mm -hmm. on, on, on all three of the homes that I've worked for, for, for Golden Eagle, you know, uh, the client's request is let's not make this look so commercial, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I get the point, you know, concrete does have its place. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is in Wisconsin is we're, we're salting and we're plowing and, and we don't want any any uneven surfaces or, or, or things like that. Even though we can salt and plow pavers, I think a lot of it comes from just this smooth, flat surface. So I get it. The concrete has its place. But I love the clients I've worked for for Golden Eagle by approaching me and saying, we don't want this to look so commercial. Let, you know, even on even on the on the on your dream home, we, we did the apron down the side mm -hmm. right on the forever home. We did the apron around it. You know, on the, on the second, the the, uh, the log home that I worked for, we did the ribbon right through the concrete. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just dressing it up a little bit. We don't want just to pour concrete outside of an amazing Golden Eagle log home. Right. 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 When I was in yeah. school, um, I remember the line from one of my teachers is, there's two types of concrete. There's cracked concrete and there's concrete that's going to crack. Yeah, I, so. just, <laughs> I just used that line the other day. That's, Did you? that's definitely part of it. And all the concrete guys would have to do is just use the base like a paver guy uses and they would solve that problem. Sure. Right. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to offend some people when I say that. Right. But mm -hmm. it's just like to put the put the open graded stone under your concrete. and Maybe we wouldn't even have that line. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I do think <laughs> outdoor living, you know, we touched on it. it's just so much more focused now. People want to take that outdoor space and you know be able to hang out there with families and stuff um what are some of the you know a lot of times you think hardscape okay i'm just gonna put a fat you know a fire pit out there just a patio what are some of the cool things you're seeing in the industry that people are starting to do for outdoor living i mean i think kitchens are like i mean th you just think about like who had an outdoor kitchen like think about who who now yeah you know has an outdoor kitchen but those are those are the hottest thing i feel in the industry right now it's hot door ki outdoor kitchens pool decks, and then not just your standard fire pit, right? Like it used to be just like a round and it used to be buried in the ground, mm -hmm. right? So now there's just like, they're just, they're going off with the versions of natural gas stuff you can build, the, the wood stuff you can even build. So I think it's maybe like, we still have fire features, they're just next level now. We still have water features, they're just next level now. And then kitchens, I feel like, you know, are, are a really trending thing right now. Everyone just like, well, you might as well include a kitchen out here. Right. right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about fire features. I'd be curious, do you like the ones that have the, the natural gas fueling it? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it comes down to like someone's lifestyle, I think a little bit, or like around a pool or things like that where you don't want ash or lots, lots of the things are like, well, you know, you know, my wife or kids are are at home. They're not necessarily the fire starters. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I haven't been home from work yet, or I have an event. They can they can easily get the fire started. I think a lot of it comes down to cleanliness. Or you know, obviously, you can go out into your backyard and, and chop up your own wood. And I don't think everybody can do that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So is it more of a hybrid system? Like, are you still burning real wood 
and using? No, you'd have to use, it'd have to be one or the other. Okay. But what I like to tell people, I call it an industrial fire pit. I mean, on the, on the Knoxville job, we have the gas one up by the pool deck, but at the same time, he's gonna get some stuff and debris from his woods or a storm that he's gonna wanna burn. Well, then you need an industrial fire pit, fire pit kind of off away from the outdoor living space, you know, or like people like the rustic feel or doing s'mores or something, but a lot of people don't like the ash and, and what the logs bring to, to the area where the, where the, where the fire feature is. Yeah, uh-huh. so. so with a wood, with a wood burning system or wood burning fire pit like that, is there things you can do to reduce the ash? You know, like the big thing is like solo stoves. They, yeah. they claim there's no, uh, you know, no smoking as well. There's a lot of the heat goes straight up. I, I personally have one of those too. And I yeah. wish I would go, I want to go back to a natural wood, wood pit. Is there something you can do? To, yeah. to eliminate some of that smokiness and ash and stuff? Yeah, I mean, the Forever Home right now ha- has a smokeless insert. Oh, so okay. it, it's, a, it's a natural gas, uh, or it's a uh, natural wood-burning fire pit, but they make a smokeless insert that kind of collects some of that smoke. And I'm not sure what it does for the heat, but a, na- a, a wood-burning one is always going to provide more heat. I mm-hmm. guess if we're, if we're going back to that, like, why would you choose one or the other? Yeah. Well, lifestyle is a part of it. You know, a uh, gas one is, you know, almost ambiance. To mm-hmm. some extent, or you have to be sitting a little bit closer, you have to have it turned up. But a wood one, I mean, you're feeling that heat right, right away. But that's the thing the smoke, but there's smokeless inserts now okay. that we can put in these to combat that a little bit. Nice. Okay. So your issue with the solo is just that the heat goes directly up. It goes right? straight up. Yeah. So all the heat, like, I mean, that's why you want to have a, a yeah. fire is most of the time in our climate, oh, is some sort of heat. You know, this you is know? pretty low hanging fruit, but obviously yeah. we know dry wood is going to matter. But also then burning a really hot fire. Hot Don't fire. you think that would reduce the amount of smoke? Yeah, that's, sure. that's what So perhaps with the smokeless one, is it maybe bringing more oxygen into sure, the Sure, yeah, right, exactly. Burning yeah, hotter. Exactly, burning hotter to reduce that smoke. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. But you say, I think, I mean, just in my experiences, fire pits are for ambiance. I think, you know, I'm not going to say like you're alone in saying that, but it's like <laughs> they're for ambiance. They're right. for sitting around, making memories around, you know, whether it's cold outside or it's fall or spring or winter, like I think you go out there as a gathering space rather than to warm up or something. And it's like, what are you gonna do? You're not just gonna stand around in a circle, you're gonna stand around a fire. It's like, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, everyone move your chairs back after an hour out yeah. there, it gets too hot. <laughs> yeah. It's just an excuse to be outside. Yeah. That's why they always say memories are built around fire pits because it's just an excuse for people to sit together, right, and talk. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. My number one lead ever since I've started my business has been fire pits. Is that right? Okay. I mean, hundred percent. I tell these kids, you know, just get to the point where you, where you can go put in a couple fire pits a summer and, and, and it's going to take off and everyone's going to want a fire pit. So that, that's what it's done for me. It'll never go away. There's something yeah. ancestral to it. You yeah, know. yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Thousands of years ago, <laughs> you got around the fire at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Shared stories. Mm-hmm you know, bonded together. Yep. So. Yeah, I like that you say it's ancestral. It is. <laughs> it is. Right. Yeah. And I still get to build them today. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So let's say a customer is thinking about designing their new home. What are some thoughts they should think about right up front, you know, when they're working with a designer or something on their hardscape, if, they, if that's a future goal of theirs? Yeah, the first one I would like to say, I don't like to see concrete walkways going from your front door to your driveway. It's the most common surface where the builder just says, we're gonna throw in a concrete walkway to get you from your from your door. I mean, we talked about that on your home, uh-huh. Zach. It's like, yeah. we're gonna do pavers from the from the driveway to the door as well. I think it's just included like the set of blueprints I'm working with right now from a builder where I was talking about where they haven't even broke ground yet. He still showed his you know idea of a front walkway and he's like, I'll give you an allowance to pour it in concrete. And I'm just like, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna put some, some nice curves on there and we're going to make it pavers. So right off the bat, another thing that could be included is like your front porch. Like a lot of people just do a concrete front porch. I've overlaid a lot of front porches to make them look like they were built out of a hardscape, you know, bricks and blocks. So it's like front porches, front walkways. I think those are the first couple things that would come to mind. But then it's how are you going to live outside? You know, are you going to have a fire pit? Are you going to have a pool? What do you want to do outside? You know, even if a person is not an outside person, they still need that front walkway to get from their door. They yeah. still need that front porch. But then, yeah. yeah, if you want to expand it out the back door, then we get into kitchens, pools, whatever else, so yeah. Does the quality of materials vary much? Yeah, I mean, as far as like- As to what you could source. So I know you, you're, of course, you would source something that's very high quality. Mm-hmm. Are there others out there that may bid a project and there's actually a drastic difference in the quality of pavers? 
Yeah, it's, it's good that you bring that up. And, I, and we talk about the young guys doing this stuff too. I guess I feel like I'm a point in my career or been doing this for 25 years. It's like, if I'm going to put all that hard work in to laying that paver it, and, and, and put the creative lines on there, it needs to, it needs to last as long as it can. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think a lot of guys, they'll, they'll cut that bid or trying to get that, ch that cheaper, the number in there to the client by sacrificing the paver. And I'm, you know, maybe, but I'm just, you know, I've, I can go back now and look at a 20 year old project <laughs> that I put in. I don't want it to look like exposed aggregate right now. So, and I think that's what we're combating as well as they look at their neighbors and it look like exposed aggregate, meaning like the, the you know, the paver top is broken down mm -hmm. and it's sinking and settling. Oh, I don't want pavers. So we're combating that, but there's something to be said there. Natural stone. That's why natural stone is one of the best options. You get what you get, right? There is no levels of, of natural stone, right? It's going to weather and look better over time. It's never going to break down. So that's, that's almost why I do a hybrid lots of times is because of the budget sometimes, right? If we made that whole entire forever home porch floor flagstone, well, I don't know if that would have fit the budget, but we can bring in the sustainable pavers, kind of incorporate the flagstone along with it. Right. So then work on that budget, but put down like that, like your flagstone mm -hmm. probably looks better now, seven years later. It's awesome. You know what I mean? It so, really is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another great thing that you do is I didn't even ask for low voltage lighting. And you said, let's do low voltage lighting around the home. We're going to light up certain trees, certain boulders. And it really just like when it's dark out and you're inside your home and the lights are on, you can look outside and you don't just see mirrored windows that are dark. You see the landscaping that's out there of everything that's lit up. And to me, it actually it improves the living experience even if you're inside the house. Yeah, right, looking out at that, right? Mm -hmm. Looking out at the runway right. or, or, whatever you, yeah. or whatever you will, yeah. yeah. That's another super uh, hot trending thing in the market right now is what they're doing with all this low voltage stuff and how, they're, you know, how everything is app controlled now. I mean, you can change the, the, the colors of the lights that are lighting up your boulders on your phone now. Uh -huh. So just the technology and, and everything else is, is, is the industry is moving along fast. And like, you know, lighting companies are even involved in that change, which is what I love for sure. So, yeah, that's cool that you say that, that Zach. Yeah, that. well, you know, think about it, right? When you're in, when our viewers, when you're in your home tonight and all the lights are on and it's dark outside, you look at your windows, you can't see what's outside. Yeah. It's just all mirrored in black. When you've got that light source beyond the windows, you know, it really extends your eye through that glass. I always say you, you spent this, this amount of money to see this in the daytime. You know, let's, let's add some lighting and you can see it in the, in the nighttime. Brilliant. Right? Brilliant. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, you kind of brought up some smart home features or, you know, advances in technology. A uh, very easy thing is just they can change throughout the year. The lighting comes on at sunrise and at sunset. So it's not a predefined time. Right. Of course, you got daylight savings time. You got the change in in uh you know when it gets dark and light throughout the day so that's that's pretty easy it kind of makes things manageable you don't have to go adjust that mm -hmm. that setting in the future uh anything else that we're seeing with the incorporation like what about music music yeah yes uh, you know speakers the same thing wired off wired off of your off of your app right controlling your sound as soon as you walk out of your home you get your you get your lights set you, you pop on your fire pit you pop on your music and that can all be you know, smart based off your phone for sure. Awesome. And yeah. you're coordinating with everyone that would do that. So that, so in a particular situation like that, I, I always say, you know, Preston Hardscape design is bricks, blocks, stones, rocks, mm -hmm. uh, low voltage lighting expert is going to come in on my jobs. I mean, it's, and I, you know, I work directly with an audio video guy who can make these low voltage stuff, you know, app based. So it's, you know, it's something I probably could have learned and adapted to do, but with everything that I do, if it's carpentry, electrical, audio video i'm sourcing the pro mm -hmm. right so yeah but you're networking with people that if a customer comes to you you can definitely put them in the right direction yep. Yep, yeah. exactly hey, uh, and you're lining them all up that way the project gets done on a timely manner because now this guy is ready to eat you know you call him up say hey i'm ready for you to come in and, and run your wire yeah exactly the foresight right mm -hmm. we know who the low voltage guy is when we're looking at the blueprints right. for your home yeah. To already know when we get there. It's a big orchestra. It's a symphony. You've got all these moving parts. But hey, when everything, when everyone is talking to each other and you're coordinating schedules, materials are there when you expect them to be. You know, it could be some beautiful music, some beautiful stuff is being made here. <laughs> the, we see that oftentimes on Golden Eagle projects. That's why it's been always so great to work with you. We like to work with others on the site that have a great reputation. You know, they hold themselves accountable. 
That way it doesn't interrupt the timeline of the project. Everything comes out better than the clients ever expect. Yeah, I know exactly. No, there's something to be said about working on a Golden Eagle project, not only the expectations of the contractor, but just the details that you guys take everything to. I guess that's why I'm, I'm stoked every time I get a call from a Golden Eagle customer because I know they're already interested in craftsmanship, quality, taking things to the next level, combining multiple mater materials, everything that I feel like I align a hardscaping business with. <laughs> that's perfect. And will you travel anywhere? I will. I mean, I always say I'll travel for the right lead. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I'm not going to turn down every, every opportunity and I don't like to be gone away from, from home for very long times anymore. I have a couple of teenage kids, but at the same time, I'm building a network now with the herd, you know, where the last couple of times I've gone down to Tennessee, I've subbed out, you know, members of the, of the community. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm more confident now than ever that I can go into any market source you know have the network there to bring all the materials that i can and then probably have a contractor there that i already know so yeah definitely give press and hardscape a call if, if you're building is it time for my plug yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> for sure i was gonna say yeah i mean i, I would love if people checked out the portfolio of, of work that i've done for golden eagle and and seeing how they can incorporate that into that home and maybe it just starts out with the design i mean i know you guys do a lot of the designing and then they can source you know, someone in their home state or wherever they're building it to put the home together, right? So okay. similar scenario, it could be with Preston Hardscape Design or, you know, we'll get together with some herd members and we'll put it together for you, so. Perfect. Awesome. Imagine a life where your home is a work of art, where nature and luxury embrace with a custom Golden Eagle log and timber home. Our expert team is here to guide you every step of the way.